All right, good evening and welcome to the regular board meeting for the Zusa Unified School District Board of Education on October 5th, 2021. We are calling this meeting to order, uh, open session at 7.02 uh, p.m. And I will begin with item 4.1, which is our flag salute. And we have Jimmy, Jimmy Ann from Powell. Jimmy, are you here with us? Yes, I am. All right, take it away. Okay, um, so my name is Jimmy Ann Terrazas. I'm a sixth grader at Powell. Um, and I will be leading you in the flag salute. So if you could please stand. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible by liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Jimmy Ann. Moving on to item 4.2, uh, roll call. Board member Rodriguez Pena. Present. Board member Bo. Here. Board member Cruz Gonzalez. Here. And I, board member Greer, am here. And board member Arianes is absent for the night. Moving on to item 4.3, uh, approval of the agenda. Uh, is there a motion to approve? Make a motion to approve. Second. Moved by board member Rodriguez Pena and second uh, by board member Cruz Gonzalez. Let's go ahead and vote. And the vote passes for yes to one absent. Moving on to item 5.1. Uh, excuse me, 5.0, report action of closed session matters, and 5.1, resolution 21-2206 uh, to approve the reduction or discontinuance of classified management services for the 2021-2022 school year. Is there a motion to approve? I make a motion to approve. Second. Moved by board member Cruz Gonzalez, seconded by board member Rodriguez Pena. Any discussion? Then let's go ahead and vote. And the item passes for yes, so one absent. Moving on to item 6.0, items from the floor, public comment on agenda or non-agenda items. This is an opportunity for the public to address the Board of Education on agenda or non-agenda items. Individual speakers may be allowed up to three minutes to address the Board of Education on any agenda or non-agenda items. When the public wishes to address the Board of Education on an agenda item, they may fill out a blue card, uh, send at the podium, or raise their hand while in Zoom attendance. The Board of Education will take blue card requests first, followed in order by speakers at the podium, then those in the Zoom attendance. And again, I just said this, but I'll, I will reiterate that uh, three we have a three minute limit. And so I, uh, if, if you are going over, I will stop you um, at, at three minutes. Um, it doesn't look like we have anyone here that has a blue card. Do we have anyone online? Uh, yes, first we have uh, Amber Fish. You may unmute your mic. Hello, I just wanted to um, come out here and say thank you to the board, to Mr. Ortega, Mr. Ronquillo, um, for getting our Hodge dual immersion teachers the aid that we requested. I know that some of us parents were very vocal about the changes that were made with our dual immersion program uh, this year. And we, we asked for a lot of help for our teachers. And it was really nice to see this week that our teachers were given an aid to help the students um, and to help them. So it, it shows us or it shows me that you are holding up to your end of our of the bargain of adding support for our teachers and your dedication to this program. So thank you 
for listening to us and thank you for following through. And that's it. Thank you, Amber. Uh, next person we have is Samira Mejia. Good evening, Honorable Board President, uh, Council Members, men and women of the community. My name is Samira Mejia, and I'm the General Manager at the San Gabriel Valley Region of Think Together, a statewide organization that provides expanded learning supports and after-school programs in over 400 school sites from preschool through high school. And here in Azusa, we're proud to serve our elementary, middle school, and high school programs throughout our partnership with Azusa Unified. Think Together's mission is to partner with schools to change the odds for kids. We all know that back to school this year has meant more to students than ever before, as we continue to rise together from an unprecedented year. We're seeing students come back to our after school programs eager to learn, reconnect with friends, and seeing, their, seeing students back um, with their friends and teachers. So in addition to Think Together's commitment to our students, after school programs are of great value to the Azusa community and our economy. According to research done by the National After School Alliance, there are over 600,000 kids in California who are left unsupervised after school. On October 28th, Think Together sites across California will be holding their annual open house event called Lights On After School. Our students are super excited to show off their hard work, creativity, and innovation from Think Together's expanded learning programs. Students have been very busy these past couple months and are eager to share this with their parents and community leaders. I would like to formally invite you all to attend our Lights On After School on October 28th at Powell Elementary from 4 to 5.30. In the event that the in-person event is canceled, if you have previous engagements, we will also be holding a virtual celebration. You can find more information on how to access our virtual event on our flyer or website at thinktogether.org. Thank you so much for your time and your service to our Azusa community. Thank you so much, Samira. And now we have Salisa Loesa. Hello, thank you for um, this time. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, oh, once again, I was one of those very vocal members for the dual immersion program. Um, and although the situation wasn't ideal, I do want to take the time also to thank you, um, the staff, superintendent, the board, the principal for bringing on an aid as well as an intervention support in the afternoon. I hope that this changes the trajectory and this continues establishing just positive um, experiences in the dual immersion program and staffing. So I want to take the time and say thank you for hearing us. Thank you for taking action. That makes a difference. I also want to invite um, cabinet board superintendent uh, to join Hodge PTA. Right now our campaign is going on and our PTA does a lot of good for our school. We provided every single student a mask. We do things like um, fund ex field trips. We do Red Ribbon Week, uh, just a variety of things. We have emergency funds, we have funds for service projects. So I invite you all to become a PTA member or donate. Our theme this year is Cougars Create, and we're just encouraging the um, Cougars knowing that they can create when, when it means with art, artistically, but also that they can create change. So I invite you to join. You can go to join Totem. We have links on our Facebook, on our Instagram. We can email, I can email them out. Um, but I thank you for your time and I invite you to join. That's it. Thank you, Salisa. Lika, do we have anyone else? We have no other hands raised. Thank you. Moving on to item 7.0, comments, reports, and requests by the Board of Education. Uh, we'll begin with Board Member Cruz Gonzalez. I have nothing tonight. Thank you. Board Member Bo. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be here. I had a couple of uh, community events to report out on, as well as uh, an idea that I want to share with my colleagues here on the board, as well as cabinet. Um, this past uh, Monday, we had our Golden Days kickoff ceremony at the library. It was a wonderful time to honor Jenny Avila, a longtime library commissioner, council member, and uh, important citizen here in Azusa. It was also a great time to see our uh, Azusa Unified Young Musicians play and really add sparkle to the evening. Um, and I'm just happy to represent the district 
on the Golden Days Committee this year and look forward to participating in the rest of the smaller scale, but no less meaningful events this year. And I encourage everyone in the community to stop by the library and see the exhibit of the historical artifact from Golden Days dating back to 1949. There are some great photographs, um, ribbons, trophies, awards. Um, it's a very well curated um, exhibit. So I encourage everyone to see that. Um, I also want to take a couple minutes uh, for my trustee time today to share my thoughts on um, where we are um, as a district uh, in the paradigm of reimagining, um, really kind of seeing the reorganization process as a new paradigm and an opportunity to create um, the best possible vision for our students, staff, and community. And as we know, uh, we have a, currently have an open position for director of IT. And I know that we've begun the, that search process. And uh, in all transparency, I've had some initial conversations with Mr. Ortega as well as Dr. Mitchell on, on my ideas on this. And um, I really want to put forward the idea, and I'd like to have a conversation at the board level on this, um, that we reimagine this head IT position as something like a CTO or chief technology officer position and give high consideration to creating that position as a new cabinet member position. I think that the pandemic has showed us many things in terms of what we can do um, given certain pressures and responsibilities for our community. It's shown us the, the integral role of technology and its impact on instruction. And it's really shown us that it can, technology if used correctly um, and used wholeheartedly, can really jumpstart and really give some rocket fuel to our instructional program. And I think um, really getting the best talent that we can from institutes and, and CTO academies across the country, bringing that to our community and to our district can really elevate what we're doing. And I think that um, you might say it's a, it's a bold step and really that there are a lot of things to figure out. But I think that if we are able to come together and say that we want to make this investment for our students and staff, that we'll look back in five years and say that we're really glad we did that and that we're really among that, that kind of lead cohort with um, other high-performing districts across the country. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Bo. Board Member Rodriguez-Pena. Uh, <clears throat> yes, good, good evening, everyone. Um, I just want to report that I went to the... Well, I went on the Zoom to the back to school night for the transitional adult school. And um, the teachers and the director did a great job on doing their PowerPoints and speaking about what their program brings to the students that attend um, the adult transitional. I was very surprised to see a teacher. I seen her name um, and I was wondering if that's a, the person that I knew. So I went online and I seen... Um, Actually, I, I was very glad to see another. She was a student, instructional aide, and now she's a teacher, Melissa Casas. Melissa Casas was inspired as an instructional aide in the adult transitional class to become a teacher with students with special needs. And if anyone knows her, she was also a young student in the Mariachi de Azusa, and now she sings professionally for Mariachi Camino Real. And I'm very proud of her. I was very proud to see her that she, was, she went back to school and became a teacher here at AUSD. Uh, <clears throat> I also joined the Adusa Pedestrian Walk. We walked um, through, a, by APU, by uh, Slauson, and by Arrow um, Highway and Azusa Avenue. And the focus was to take note of any safety issues, such as handicap ramps. Believe it or not, some of those handicap ramps are outdated sidewalks, roadways to improve conditions that will encourage walking. Azusa will make walking in the, make, making it safe, comfortable, convenient, and more accessible for the pedestrians of all ages. You actually don't really realize what you really see when you're, when you're driving. And when you're walking, you finally, you know, I've been driven to by arrow. You know, I drive by there all, every day practically. But certain things that you notice, like, oh, well, I didn't realize it. You know, there's a bump in the road where someone could trip. But these are the great things that the city of Azusa um, ha had this team go out and, and a community residents joined and walked. And we took note of certain, and, and we gave our input. And that was really good. So they are going to start working on these roads um, throughout the community. 
And again, another success though, Azusa Leaders to Learning Golden Days virtual fundraiser on Saturday. We made enough for three more scholarships, $1,000 scholarships, and then some. I would like to thank the donors, all the all ed directors, Mayor Robert Gonzalez, Mayor Pro Tem Jesse Avila Jr., Robert Zamora, parent Mary Dodd, board president Arianes, former board member Helen Jaramillo, and of course, we even had our own lunch with the superintendent. So we sold him that day. <laughs> ELS outlet, Adelinos, Maxis, Maricios. But wait, our cash winning prize winner of $630 was our community liaison, Anna Gonzalez. You wouldn't believe that her daughter won last fundraiser, $600. And they only bought two tickets. So see, one ticket would do it. So, um, but Anna was so kind that she returned $300 back to the foundation for our scholarship funds. Also, our fantastic entertainment was Studio 26 with um, Mr. Uh, Kimball Coburn. I want to thank him. And we had Azusa Orchestra director, Mary Turner, and they really enjoyed the entertainment. So we could not have did all this without everyone's help. And I want to really thank you and appreciate that. And I'm sure the students will too. So I want to congratulate also uh, Azusa Glasson High School Interact Club for being recognized last night at the city council meeting by the city of Azusa and the LA County Supervisor Hilda Solis for creating the Golden Days logo slogan, United We Shine. I would like to thank the advisors, Mary Turner. Mary Turner is always so involved. And, and also Darla Elliott from Gladstone High School. And happy Golden Days week. So I brought my badge today. Watch out. I'm in town. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Board Member Rodriguez Pena. And uh, for me this evening, I just want to uh, remind any who are interested that this Thursday I will be holding an online coffee. Uh, that's October 7th at 6 p.m. This will be held on Zoom. Uh, if you have attended one of these meetings in the past, you should have by now already received an email that, that gives you information on how to. Uh, communicate your interest and 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 uh, have the details to be able to join the the meeting. And again, this meeting is open to anybody who would like to really discuss any any item uh, whatsoever. Um, it, it's a uh, intentionally structured conversation to be able to have a conversation uh, around er areas of uh, uh, that we want to celebrate or or areas that are that are concerns. Uh, and so, anyone in the community is invited to take part in that. And again, if you have not received one of those invitations and you're interested please feel free to reach out to me on any channel really. Um, and I'll make sure that you get that uh, information. Moving on to item 8.0, uh, comments and reports by superintendent cabinet and student board member. I will uh, turn it over to you, Superintendent Ortega. Uh, thank you, good evening. I uh, just wanted to report a couple of things. Uh, I had the pleasure of being invited by the K-12 Foothill Consortium. Uh, they held a CTE tour uh, that, fe that featured our very own uh, Jim Haig's Digital Media Arts Program at Glasson High School. Uh, although I've been in that room uh, several times, it's just a reminder of what an awesome opportunity our students have whose interests are in that field. Uh, we have top-notch equipment. Uh, we uh, continue to expand on that program, uh, adding um, new uh, technology, and so just very grateful for that. And just want to thank last one high school, Mr. Haig, uh, for the passion and the project-based approach uh, that they are taking uh, to that pathway. Um, as uh, board member Rodriguez Pena stated, uh, this Saturday we held our uh, all ed foundation fundraiser. Uh, we were able to raise uh, over $3,000 uh, to benefit the students uh, and staff of our district. I do want to thank uh, publicly the foundation for all of their work in raising funds to support the district and to all of the participants who helped by either buying tickets, uh, donating or participating in the auctions. Uh, lastly, I just wanna uh, say that I was able to join uh, Daniel Infante Sanchez, uh, who is our current uh, teacher of the year. Uh, he is a teacher from uh, Glasson High School and Maria S Sims, our former uh, teacher of the year, um, they were recognized at our 
in-person LACO Teacher of the Year Banquet. Uh, again, just nice to be in person uh, to get the recognition that they deserve. And it's just a great, uh, a great event that really highlights the impact uh, that teachers have on our students. Thank you. Good evening. I would like to give appreciation tonight to uh, Gary Creel, who is our Director of Child Welfare and Attendance. He has been organizing and facilitating our vaccination clinics with our partnership with Mercy Pharmacy. And last Saturday, uh, they administered 236 vaccine doses, which were first doses of the Johnson Johnson, uh, second and third doses of the Pfizer uh, vaccine. Our next clinic is Saturday, October 16th at Gladstone High School at nine o'clock in the morning from nine to 12. Um, I also attended uh, the Golden Days kickoff last night and had an opportunity to hear our fantastic orchestra and our Azusa High School advanced choirs. And it was just, a, it was a lovely evening outside to see everybody out there. Um, also uh, had an opportunity to see our um, Gladstone and Azusa High School Interact students uh, received certificates of award from uh, the city council and also Supervisor Hilda Solis's office. So it was wonderful to uh, to see all of the students getting recognized, uh, their advisors, and then of course the Azusa Rotary Partners who supports our Interact um, students. So congratulations to them. Thank you. And good evening, Board of Education staff and community. I just want to update the Board of Education and the community that today we launched our calendar committee meetings. Uh, we are scheduled to meet four times in October. We look forward to finalizing this process by the beginning of November to provide the association's time uh, to vote on a calendar. And we look forward to bringing to the Board of Education a finalized calendar uh, to the regular board meeting in December for a vote. Thank you. Good evening, board and fellow cabinet members. Um, I would like to use this opportunity to publicly thank uh, Ms. Shannon and Ms. Sylvia, and as well as Ms. Melissa, who assisted in putting on our um, September 30th ASB and booster training, which we were able to train all of our ASB clubs and our parent groups on proper handling of how to do revenue recognitions, how to account for your expenditures, um, what expenditures are allowable for a booster and an ASB. Um, they've received handouts as well as a four hour training um, that was facilitated by our auditors. Um, additionally, I would like to thank Brian uh, Allen, uh, who was able to procure five more temporary AC units that had been successfully uh, installed at both Azusa High School and Glassstone High School. Thank you. And then from our student board member, I believe that we do have Crystal Lamino here from Gladstone High School. Crystal, are you there? Yes, I am. The floor is Can yours. Can you hear me? Yes. Gladstone had its homecoming game and dance on September 17th and 18th. Students were excited to be back in person and celebrate the in-person rituals that we used to have before schools were closed. Gladstone is proud of the football team's win against Workman last Friday and the tennis team's performance against Workman as well. Gladstone's ELAC meeting is virtually on October 7th at 8.15 a.m. Links for the online meeting will be shared with, with parents via Blackboard and school website. ASB is preparing for our club rush on October 8th during our lunch. We have 19 clubs participating and that students can learn about and sign up for if they're interested. Gladstone counselors are planning for an in-person FAFSA night to support parents with the FAFSA process. The first support night will, will occur on October 20th from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. in English and the second night will be on October 21st from five to seven in Spanish. Thank you so much, Crystal. We move on to item uh, 9.0, general functions and specifically 9.1, full reorganization. Superintendent Ortega. Thank you. <clears throat> um, at a previous uh, board meeting, uh, when uh, our study session talked about a uh, school a reorganization, uh, board president Arianes and I were tasked uh, with uh, coming up with a timeline uh, based on the feedback of the Board of Education. Um, and we were able to do that. Um, and so uh, today we launched a day one of, 
of three uh, that we have outlined. Uh, today is an info item uh, for the Board of Education uh, to begin conversation about uh, Model 3 and Model 4. We have our second uh, info only item uh, scheduled uh, two weeks from now, which is uh, the 19th uh, of October. And then on 11 2, the 2nd of November, um, is our third meeting. Um, and that meeting it has been slight, slated for an info action um, item. And so um, that's, that's um, based on the feedback. That's what we came up with. And so I turned the board o I turned the floor over to the Board of Education uh, to begin conversations about school reorganization and the models uh, at hand. Well, that's uh, definitely broad, but we have have space here to, to to discuss. Does anyone have any anything uh, to start our conversation? Okay, I'll start. I was looking at me. <laughs> um, uh, I, I honestly um, had my focus on a certain model, but as I go on hearing more about it, I'm, I'm open minded person. So, you know, I, I like to do my research and speak to staff and students and parents. So I have changed my way just a little bit, but I'm still very concerned regarding the, um, the one to two two high school models. Um, I'm concerned on the one high school model having to do with um, overcrowding, uh, traffic, um, teacher to student ratio. You know, I, I do know we have a ratio cut, we'll just say, you know, one to 35, for example. So maybe right now we have one to 30 or 28, I, I'm not sure, but, you know, then we're gonna reach one to 35 if we, put them together. So then the, I think it's, it's very hard for the students to learn. And it's very hard to have so many students in the classroom that way. That, that really concerns me on the one high school. And, um, and of course, and, all, and, and also the traffic. And uh, most important thing that we, we're doing is due to declining enrollment. I also see students that live on another part of town. They have a high school right to their right. I, 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 I fear that they will go that route and we will lose even more students. But I do not like the 7 to 12 model. When I first, when we first started, I assumed that the seventh and eighth graders would be in a whole different section. But as we were spoke the last time, like I said, you know, now I'm hearing that they will be mixed with the high school students in PE or elective classes. And, and I'm not for that. I, I worked 40 years in a junior high school, and I do see that the seventh graders and eighth graders, they're in their own little world. I think they need to grow on their own and not all of a sudden go and mix with the high schools. I'm very concerned about that. Um, I have other situations, but I will start with that. Thank you. Mr. Ortega, has, has the district um, begun the process of doing any traffic studies? We have not begun uh, traffic study. What would the process be to start that? We can start doing that. Um, again, are we saying like a traffic study for every model, every school? Or is there a specific uh, data point that, that we need? or, or... Um, Did we? Board Member Cruz Gonzalez, did, did you get the answer to your question, or, or if you can refresh my memory, about um, the distance that students have to travel? Um, was that in our board packet? Yes. Okay. I, be I believe, if I'm not mistaken, seven miles. And do we have data that show, like, um, or could we compile the data that show the, the cluster of students? So, for example, um, do we have more students living on the, the outside of that at the edge of the seven mile radius and what impact that would have if they were going to a different campus, um, kind of looking at the whole district as a whole and figuring out how far students would have to travel. Is, is it more on the, the near side or would locations of campus greatly impact more students traveling a farther distance? I think that's some of the questions that I think about and also in terms of um, 
students who walk or bicycle versus students who are um, have auto pick up and drop. If I'm not mistaken, and Latasha, I don't know if you know this or not, but if I'm not mistaken, uh, with the exception of uh, students who live in uh, in the canyon, uh, the students within uh, the not in the canyon uh, don't um, go past that seven mile um, radius. And so um, technically, um, there is no transportation provided, but we have been speaking about, and this was brought up during the school reorganization process, that it is important that regardless of the seven mile, that we still offer uh, transportation, um, especially I think that was brought up in consideration of model three. So you're talking about home to school, home to school transportation, not special ed transportation? That is correct. I don't remember that as a deep topic. Was that in, in the meetings themselves or was that here at the board? Uh, that was in the meetings. Uh, that also shows up in our surveys as well. Um, this this notion of um, if we're going to be closing schools, uh, again, I believe it shows up more for those that want Model 3, uh, that it's important uh, that we are providing transportation because technically, right, you're going from one side of town to the next side of town. So I think it would be helpful um, to understand, because I don't, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think I, we saw like cost estimates for that with some of these models. With I guess it would be model three. Did we? Did I miss that? Was it? Was it in there? So there was no cost estimate because we currently have the fleet that if we needed to transport all of our students right now, we have enough buses. We would just have to increase our drivers. So that, but that, but that would be a cost, correct? Yes. Yes, but that was not included in any of the models. Yeah, so it would be, so I guess what I'm asking is that would be good to understand, right? How those, any, any, any anticipated transportation costs um, that would, that would be required. Um, and I would just, I mean, I would just say, I, I appreciate that we have enough bus buses, but I, I know there's also maintenance. There's, you know, having to buy new buses as you upgrade. I, I mean, I appreciate we have natural gas buses, right? A lot of districts are moving to, to electric buses at this point. Um, so I think that's important information for us to take into consideration. And I also, I also wanted to add that <clears throat> I did notice that model three and four that, uh, and I will say it again, that I see an elementary school, middle school, and a high school um, foreclosure on those both models. So the question I have is on model three and four, the Board of Education one or the other, or can we mix it? You know, you know what I mean? Um, um, that's my one question. Then I also see an elementary school, and, and now I'm talking about enrollment that has maybe 300 and something students, and then the other school has maybe 408 students that have already been moved there from another school. And then now the, um, um, oh, now I'm sorry. Now, now the smaller school, I, I, I think that should be easier to, to move than this other school that has more students and that have already been moved there from another school just a couple of years ago. Thank to, you. To address the first question, uh, we have been uh, very open and very transparent uh, through the whole school reorganization uh, team process um, that their recommendation uh, could be um, accepted by the Board of Education. It could be outright rejected by the Board of Education, or it could be amended uh, by the Board of Education. So the answer is yes. Um, the two models that exist right now uh, do come from the team, uh, but they know, um, we said it more than enough times that this was a recommendation only and that the Board of Education could change those models or can come up with a different model that we haven't even discussed or thought about. So I do, I do have a question and, and maybe lead to more information, but did, um, as you talked about just looking at the models, um, was there any discussion about what Glendora High School looked like and how it's set up? Because my understanding is it was built at the same time as it was the high school, right? They've been able to reconfigure to, to house a very large student population. So was that part of the conversation or have we looked at what that school looks like, the, the layout of that school? 
So to answer the first part of the question, yes, um, Glendora High School, as other high schools uh, have been mentioned uh, in terms of if we went to one high school, like what 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 could be or or what what we can you know aspire to or think about or use as as an example. Uh, but have we gone to to look at it? No. So my understanding is that it was actually the exact same layout as this high school. So it's not like maybe other high schools where this is actually when they were first built, it looked identical. So that's so why maybe I'm the same architect. Right. So that's why I'm recommending that maybe we look at that and just in, so we can maybe address some concerns about what what would a large high school look like on that uh, you know with with the with the original footprint that we had. Yeah, absolutely, a, a, a thousand percent. And and also too, I mean, just our own history, right? Our own history in Azusa. There, there was a time uh, when our high schools were large. Uh, there was a time when on the existing campuses right now. Uh, we house a large amount of high school uh, students. And then, um, so apologies if it wasn't the update, but in terms of the demographic piece, when do we anticipate in getting the information about, or did that already come to us? But in terms of like that, you know, the multi-year outlook for demographic? Ah, uh, yes, that was in the board packet and you have uh, 10 years of that. So we're not gonna get 20 years like we requested? We did speak to the demographer and they said uh, 10 years is, is uh, as far as they go. Okay. And then I just, I just have one last question um, regarding the, the high schools. You know, um, on the models, you know, everyone assumes Azusa High School because I know it's in Azusa, California. But at one point they told us, don't look at the schools, look at the capacity. You know, so there's two high schools. They're both in Azusa Unified School District. We have to look at what is the, I believe the capacities are the same, one's not or close to, to each other. Um, you know, what is the newest school? You know, which one has more room? We haven't looked at that. We just everyone just seems to assume that it should be there because it's in Azusa and it's there. But you know, they're both in Azusa Unified School District. That that's just a thought. A couple thoughts that I had. Um, the one. I had been I had been kind of operating under the assumption based off of early conversations that the the whole concept of a 712 model would in, include I, I remember hearing language like a school within a school. I remember I remember hearing things like that. And um I guess as as that figured my imagination around what what how how might we creatively offer specialized electives to to our, our younger students, if there were uh, uh, teachers and 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 courses and programs, equipment that was on the same campus, and and, and my mind went to how might we, you know, creatively utilize that to, to, for them to gain access. I don't know that my mind back then went to the idea of fully mixing uh, seventh and, and and eighth grade students with with uh, high high school age students. Um, and I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear some for us to discuss a, a little bit about that and, and share the, the thinking behind that and the, the where and why we, we land. What, what does that look like? If we can unpack more of the model, because I, I, as I've talked to a number of, of, of folks, I hear concerns and I, and I understand the concerns that are involved with that uh, layout. And I'll let cabinet chime in if they want to chime in after after I kind of open this up, <clears throat> um, I think it's still a school within a school. Uh, but I think, I think what we're talking about um, is this is not going to be a fenced off, like the kids will never mix type of environment. Um, right now uh, at our high schools, if we look at our core classes, uh, we do have a lot of classes at 36. Um, we do have some electives uh, at 36. Uh, but we have some courses uh, with five kids. And so the, the, the concept of reorganization right, is to maximize and be able to offer uh, multiple programs and multiple avenues. And so if we, if we, if we do not envision uh, or think about, especially like elective courses that, that can be taken by uh, multiple or multi-age uh, students, uh, then we might still be constrained 
uh, and still challenged with the type of uh, programs and the amount of programs that we offer that are not, quote unquote, past the core, right? Um, so not to say that that's insurmountable. Now you are going from technically three middle schools to two, seven, eight. So that helps. And that, and that is definitely uh, a plus, but we never, um, and again, not that it can't be, but we definitely never thought that this would be a fenced off, um, never, ever going to be able to, to, to come together at, at no point in time. Uh, that definitely was not the thinking uh, behind that. But the concept of school within a school, just like, just like in, in, in some ways, uh, Valleydale and, and Hodge, right, have the dual immersion program, kind of a school within a school, kind of the same thing. But, but, but no, we never thought that it would be completely fenced off or roped off and that there, that would, there would be no, no flow. But again, not to say that that cannot happen, uh, but that was never the thinking. And actually, so could you speak to that? I mean, if, could, could you speak to the viability of, of this if, if there were actual barriers? So, so we, you know, school within a school, you talk about dual immersion at, at Valleydale or, or Hodge. Uh, my mind goes to uh, adult ed in Sierra High School. My, my, my mind goes to adult transition and Magnolia. So that, that's, that's where my mind goes when I think of school within a school. Can you speak to the potential viability of that Type of school within a school with a 712 bond? Um, so, I mean, again, it's possible, but then I guess the, the question would be if, if, if the whole concept is to rope it off, now we're talking about an administrator, a secretary, like, like legitimately a school, um, which again, can be on the same campus, um, but for that matter, can be off campus as well, right? Um, so that's, again, the feasibility I think is there, but there's these other things that right now we're not considered as part of the 712 model, because again, if you're completely fencing it off, now you're thinking about a, a, a staff that is dedicated to run that school, just like we do for MATP, just like we do Sierra, uh, and adult school. Um, Mr. Ortega, and for the next uh, info meeting on the 19th, I'd like to request that um, we get some, you know, a summary or a memo outlining the, what the research says about the barriers and drivers for, to successful 712 program. So I know we're, we're positing things like um, our junior high kids having access to higher level electives. Um, we don't have to, there is a lot of precedent and research around what work and, and, and what also are the barriers to those successful programs. I'd like us to have a greater understanding um, <clears throat> from, from other districts and, and the literature. And in, ad in addition to that, if, if we could also as, as add, ensure that when we have these items, so we're, we're going to have two more conversations that are, that are, that are scheduled. At each of these conver conversations and items, could we include attachments that that lay out the the, the models that we're that we're discussing and and even some of the info? Um, I, I'm thinking about the the analysis of the qualitative da uh, data. Is that something that has been been shared out widely, um, or 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 not shared out shared out widely? Uh, but I, I think of some of those some of those requests for information that we have. If that were here. And and available for anybody who is tracking along with us as we're having these these subsequent conversations. They're they're looking at the the, the same information as as we're making these requests. And I also would like to see if I don't know if it's possible that we can visit a school that's a seven to twelve model. I I've never seen one before myself. I do uh, Dr. Mitchell. I know I spoke to her and I know her daughters go to the seventy twelve seventy twelve school, but I, I would like to see it. I mean I don't know if we have time to do that. But I, I would like to see what does it look like, you know, other than on paper, I, I would like. So I do, I do want to say, since we're talking about 7 to 12, I, I am concerned at, for the high school level, and I appreciate you saying that we have some classes that are full. 
at just this, the number of high school students that would be on each campus, because it wouldn't reduce, I mean, it would still, those would be small numbers and we're pushing, a th we're going to be under a thousand soon at both high schools, which makes it very difficult to offer a full fledged program for those kids and opportunities. Right. I mean, the schools that I see that are that small, I think of like the, the, the one they have and passing is not a good example because they have a lot of small schools, but like their smallest school, it's a specialized IB school, right? Same thing you see in West Covina. These are not, we, they're not offering full athletic programs, all the, all the pieces that we want to see at a comprehensive high school. So I have a lot of concerns about having us. I also have the concerns about the, you know, having mixing the grades, but just about like, what kind of, what kind of like opportunity are we giving these high school kids when they have these very small schools? I did want to ask a question um, because I, and I appreciate you making it clear that it really is, it, you know, that we're, we can be open to other ideas. One of the, one of the suggestions that we all got via email was looking at maybe looking at one of the high school sites to be the site of the middle school, because then you would have a gym that we don't have in any of our high schools. We would have some really amazing, we'd have an amazing build, right? So I'm just wondering uh, from our perspective around having a conversation about what would that look like, right? I mean, I think in my mind, I think some of the issues that would come up would be transportation, right? Because it'd be very difficult to ask middle schoolers to travel, travel all the way across the, across the whole city. I, I don't know. I think those are things we need to discuss, but I would like us to consider if we go that route of having one comprehensive middle school, one comprehensive high school, think about how do we best utilize the site, right? Because I, I mean, I think, and then plus the fact that you then wouldn't have to modernize a different middle school. So we'd be saving money on those two middle school sites. So that's something for us to think about. Yeah, I, I like that, that idea. Well, I, I'm curious, when we say that something for us to think about, where in this process is that thinking about happening? If, 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 the, if November 2nd is the, the scheduled decision, is that think about now? Well, so <laughs> like then I guess maybe my request is for the next meeting, can you come back and show what would be the feasibility of having one comprehensive high school and one middle school and really looking at what would the, what would, how would that look at, and to be you know, on the point about being agnostic, right? What would it look like to have Gladstone being the high school, Azusa being the middle school, and also Azusa being the high school Either and or. Gladstone being the middle school, right? Yeah. So we can have a conversation yeah. about what that looks like. And I think the transportation piece for me is probably one of the most key factors. I think transportation and understanding those operating costs, right? Because we have a sense of the capital costs already. Um, and I think just as important, if we were to have a single comprehensive middle school, what would that mean for course offering? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm guessing it would greatly expand, but I'd like to see more detail on what, what the change would be from what we have now at our separate middle schools and what it could be if we went that direction. Uh, just, I think I heard it correctly, but just, Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to bring Model 3 Reimagined. Um, and the reimagining is that we're going to have one of the high schools become the, the middle school. Uh, we're going to flip it both ways. So this is what it looks like if Azusa is a middle school and Glassstone is a high school. This is what it looks like if Azusa is a high school, Glassstone is a high school. We want to look at the impact that that's going to have uh, on program. And we're also going to be looking at the impact uh, of of what it what it looks like uh, to provide transportation. I also would like to see the, you know, what does the enrollment look like and and the capacity. You know, we, we keep talking about capacity, but I, I like to compare both of them on on both models. And we'll I'll add that. You know, when you when you speak of a time, of a, ancient times past when, um, there were more students at, at the high schools. I think back of my time uh, in in the, the the high schools, and and so is it is it helpful if if we were to uh, to have a snapshot of let's say 15, 20, 20 years ago and look at what the capacity was back then to get a sense of how we have how we have operated um, at, at various capacities. Absolutely. So you're talking about looking at like the peak year. Or something? Sure. You're talking about just the high schools too, because it was. It, I mean, it varies, right? Because we had right. a large group move to. Correct. I think. I think so. Um, I mean, what what are thoughts on? Do, do, is do is it valuable to have other, other? Do we defer to our to figure out like what you know? Thanks. 
I, I would say at least I would say at least high schools. My my, my question is in is in uh, um, the context of, of high schools. But as you're looking at that, if if it makes sense to include others, uh, please please do as well. I'm sorry. Did we discuss that we wanted to see what the 7012 model looked like? We do that. Um, I think you requested also, that, Yolanda. You said you wanted, you wanted to know what it looked yeah, like. Yeah, I, I I want to see what it looks like, but I, I like to see um, again what programs you're offering. But but I also like to see. I still like to see the separation of it. Okay. A high school. I mean, a, a school and a school. So reimagined. Oh, as we talk about reimagined, if it was reimagined right. with greater barriers and, you know, intentional yeah. structural barriers. I, I want to see that. I mean, Two schools on one site. Two schools on one site. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, there was also a request for research uh, around 712. And a, a small thing, and I think it goes to uh, Board Member Greer's um, comment about having all the additional data and documents that we're requesting to have that available to the public. Um, there are those, you know, newcomers in Azusa that maybe are not familiar with where all the schools are. And I think it would be great to have a map of the district with the locations of the site. So as we're looking at school A, B, C, D, we can really visualize the distances and the concentration of campuses throughout the city. On that note, can I also ask a clarifying question? Uh, is this going back or moving forward? Uh, because there was a lot of requests uh, and again, it's there, so it's, it doesn't cost anything, but are we saying for the 10, uh, what were we, 1019 board meeting, go back and uh, attach uh, the survey analysis, attach where school reorganization team members, um, like all, all of that. Um, there was a, a quite a bit of, of requests, which is fine. I just want to make sure I understand what we're attaching for 1019. <laughs> but will... that's the purpose of this meeting, correct? Meaning what? Our meeting that we're having, that's the discussion. That's the purpose of us speaking about it. You know, wanting to see certain, you want to see something different than I may want to see in yeah. him and her. Yeah. That's why we're here. Yeah, and I, I would say, I, I recognize that should, should someone expand this item uh, based off of what we're requesting, there could be a number of, of attachments that, 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 that could be there. But I... I think it's. I, I would suggest that it's better to err on the the, the side of of over communicating, and if and if someone does not want to click and read through, they do they don't have to, but still still providing it. Board member, do you mean the kind of like the summative document, right? So that the last school, the last committee slide deck that had kind of the final recommendations and the qualitative survey analysis from Cal Poly Cal Poly Pomona, like those are things that. Um, those are some new things that we haven't seen that, right. that haven't been made available to the public. I am not hearing that, but if that's what it is, I'm hearing that, is that what you all the requests from the board around school reorganization, that those become attachments. So I'll give you just some example. Uh, it was requested that I reach out to uh, the parents that were not present at the last school reorganization team meeting and find out how they would have voted. And so that was provided. There was a request uh, to know uh, when was, uh, how long have the, the, the parents been on the, on the committee? When did we switch out? And so I just want to be crystal clear about what, what you want. Uh, there was, again, a lot uh, that was requested, which is no big deal. Uh, the, all that can be attached. I just want to make sure that I'm attaching the right thing. That's not what I had in mind. Okay. Um, I, okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, so I, I I wonder if there is if if there are questions that we asked at, at previous meetings. Maybe it, it's valuable to, to to share some of that information out. I I, I I I suppose it's it's usually more helpful if it's if it's in writing so that someone can see it. But that so maybe, but that's not what I was requesting. I'm saying more along the lines of the the, the you know summary document. Um, again, the analysis of quali qualitative data from from Cal Poly as an example. Um, I think about today we're having a conversation, and so if somebody if somebody were tuning in today. We and going to nine point one, there's no information there. So, so if, as we're talking model three, we're saying model three, model four. The way that someone would know what we're talking about is they're needing to dig in on our website or look at previous uh, school board meetings to know what we mean when we say these things. So, providing that information so that as we are discussing, anybody who is here is able to track along um, if they've read the, the the attachment. That would be my hope, and but and I still recognize that that's a that's a kind of a a, a large. Ask, and it's still a large number of, of requests. 
but that's what I had in mind more so than um, some, some of the questions that we've had along the way. Okay. I just want to add one thing. I, I, I don't know if, if we should have, this is really important. This is really important to this community. This is going to be a lifetime thing. And, and, and I'm feeling pressured because um, we need to meet one more time and then we have to vote. You know, I, 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 and I know we have an agenda that we need to follow during our meetings. I, I would like to ask for a special meeting just on reorganization, just, just on reorganization. Um, between now and then, wherever, but I, I just not comfortable just having a meeting and I know we have an agenda, we're still going to go through and then we're going to have another, it's the, our next meeting on the 19th and then we have a regular agenda on top of that. I, I don't know how many feels so about that. So a special that, meeting I, where, where like we just discuss just the reorganization. So special meetings where we take action on the item or just this yes. where we do additional discussion and then we take action at a regular meeting. I'm sorry. I said, do you want us to actually take action at a special meeting or do you no. want us to take action at the regular meeting? Just at, put at a regular meeting, okay. but I just like to have a special meeting just to just for, for information. I mean, look how long it's taken. We have a lot of questions. I right. see it and I'm just feeling like. Right. Because at the first study session, we were supposed to listen. And now that we have more, no. we, I, I agree. I think we need a, a set we aside time so that we can have this discussion. Because we never said anything. It was our listening, right? You're right. So on October 26th, does that work? Because we have meetings every other Tuesday this yeah, I mean, I am available on the 26th of October. 26th? I am as well. Yes, I'm good. And the 26th works for me. I do. I do still think I'd. I'd like to request the information that some of the information that we requested today to have that come back to us at the at the next meeting. Yes. As you originally intended. Mm -hmm. And and made available. Yes. And this is an addition too. So we're still having this conversation at the next board meeting, correct? I would say yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. But I I think we asked for a lot of information, so there's probably a lot for you to share at the next meeting with us. Now knowing that we have two more, at least at least three more conversations about this, and and we we've sent out some 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 requests and some some homework to to the cabinet. Um, does anyone else have any other questions, comments to to add at this time? Just a clarif a clarifying request. So when we're looking at um, the idea of a comprehensive middle school and the impact on the curriculum. And what that would mean for course access and availability. I would also like to see um, as much detail as we can get regarding the cost of implementing some of these programs as Dr. Mitchell presented two meetings ago. The idea of what would an IB elementary and middle school program look like? What would a design academy look like in terms of staffing, professional development, um, other training, specialized equipment? I think the more information, you know, the closer we can get to having some of those estimated costs would help us understand the full picture of, of any change. So I do want to just point out for us that we spent a lot of time talking about the secondary schools and really didn't talk about the elementary. Right. Um, but in my mind, um, if we do go the route of, you know, one comprehensive each, right, which, which elementaries, like what they end up looking like to me matters is, is going to, this is, it's going to matter on which, which way direction we go with it, with the, with the high, the secondary schools. Can I, uh, one point of clarity as well, we talked about having a meeting, adding a meeting to the 26th. We haven't talked about what, what time. Um, I, I would, I would request that we, that we have it at a normal time, which is seven, but it start at 7 PM because that's a normal start time. So even, even though it may be, it may be helpful to start earlier for, to, to allow for more conversation. I think it's important that it happened at a time that most uh, expect and anticipate the meeting to take place. So 1026 at 7 p.m. Correct. Special meeting, no closed session. Correct. Any other questions, comments? Hmm. Sure. Moving on then to item 
Uh, Azusa Unified School District one-time funding update. Miss Latasha Jamal. Thank you. Let me prepare my screen to share. So good evening, board, um, fellow in the cabinet. Uh, Dr. Mitchell and I will give uh, the board an update on our one-time funding. Um, this is giving us a summary of what we have remaining, the spend dates, and what our plant expenditures are for those appropriate funds. I'm sorry, it's a delay, so I have to wait till it comes up. So right here, we have a listing of all of our one-time funds. So we see we have a total of $37 million that we either have now or plan, are scheduled to receive. So on this schedule, we see what the funding flows from. So we have the CARES Act. It has the funding source. It has the allocated resources. And it also the appropriate deadlines as to when we have to spend the funds by. We show that our current allocations, we show expenditures if we have any to date, and what is the current balance as of right now. So here you'll see we have ESSER 1, where we have $1.8 million, year 1, $400,000. And then we go down to your ESSER 3, where it's approximately $20 million. That is the one set of allocation that we do not have, but those are just, um, that is the funding that we're slated to receive. And you will have the planned expenditure plan that will have to be adopted at our subsequent board meeting. Now, going down, we have our ELO. So these are funding. The reason why the balance. Can you hold on? So, so just. Which which um which amount is going to be in the plan that we need to adopt? Esther three. Esther. So that's seventeen point six plus the four point four. Any other question? Okay. And so then we have our ELO um, grant. The reason why the balance shows zero is not an indication that we have spent it all, but that is showing that we have already approved those planned expenditures and they are budgeted. And they were approved back in May at our last board meeting. So for this presentation, we are going to go over each funding source one by one. We're going to identify the funding source, what we have available. We are also going to show the slide that shows the allowable expenditures, as well as the next slide will show you our planned expenditures to spend the um, allocated funds. So here we are going to start with ESSER 1. So ESSER 1, we have $1.8 million available. These are a summary of the allowable uses. This is coming directly from CDE. So it tells us exactly what we can and cannot spend the funds on for each of the allocation funds that we have received. Coming here, keeping with the same line, this is our plant expenditure plan for the $1.8 million. We've been getting uh, quite a bit of uh, input from stakeholders, including staff and students. And we will have, be having an upcoming meeting uh, that includes parents as well. And these are um, what we are considering uh, as areas for the expenditures. So additional certificated instructional staff at both the elementary and secondary levels, reading specialists to support our literacy plan. We have a plan that we are aligning to uh, the state literacy plan. Um, Saturday summer professional learning for certificated and for classified staff. So beyond the workday, which does alleviate the need for subs. Staff for mental health support, uh, funding to support uh, any possible uh, school reorganization, and then funding for Western Justice Center to continue the program and to expand as well. So keeping in line with the same plan. So we go to our gear one funds. We currently have $410,000 remaining. This is a list of the allowable uses, again, according to CDE. And here is our planned expenditure plan for the $410,000. In some of the different um, kind of buckets of money, as we like to refer to it, um, you'll see some of the same items that are repeated as we are able to use uh, multiple funding to support some of the larger expenditures. Uh, here you will see summer programming. And you'll see funding to support tutoring for students and as well as continuing to expand and to purchase culturally relevant instructional materials, 
which would also include um, elementary classroom library materials. Now move into ESSER 2, where we have $9.7 million. This is where uh, we have until September 2023 to send these funds. Here, it outlines the allowable uses. And here is our proposed expenditure plan for the $9 million. And this funding specifically delineates uh, purchasing uh, technology, so hardware, uh, network. So we would use this to upgrade and improve our network technology. Uh, we've also included a social emotional learning coach as a, a possibility for our uh, mental health support for students. Now move into ESSER 3. ESSER 3, we will receive approximately $20 million. It is broken up into two buckets. 20% of our ESSER 3 allocation has to be applied to instruction. And so here we're showing the first, the $17.5 million. This is the allowable expenditures for ESSER 3. And our current expenditures plan for ESSER 3 for the $17 million is to upgrade district-wide um, with the hopes and alignment with our school reorganization, all of our HVAC um, or the heating and ventilation and AC conditioning units, as well as to continually improve ventilation by redoing our windows so they can actually open um, and also incorporate shade structure and outdoor seating on our campus. Now I'm going to the 20% allocation of the 4.4. This is our current expenditure plan. So in this uh, bucket, we have our steel instructional coaches to support our steel instructional implementation. Um, so the steel coaches, in addition to supporting teachers with instructional planning and the implementation, the steel coaches would also be supporting the grade level professional learning communities with supporting how we use data to inform instruction and provide differentiated support through instructional grouping. Uh, we have a plan to have steel at all of our elementary sites. And right now we are um, implementing, uh, this year we're super excited, steel at, at three of our elementaries. But our plan is to expand to all of our elementaries. And so in the meantime, while we're waiting for that expansion, we would have um, additional instructional coaches. And it would be the same idea. So um, these would it'd be the same approach as the steel coaches. And then those coaches would transition uh, to be being steel coaches at the other site. Now moving over to our in-person instructional grant. Um, we currently have $2.7 million available. Following the same format, these are the allowable uses for those funds. And here is our planned expenditure plan. And so again, you'll see some of, uh, some of these uh, same um, areas that we can uh, spend additional funding on. But some of the other things that we've added to this one are experiential learning. So um, things such as field trip, um, also our project-based learning implementation, we would like to spend it on that as well. And to our last bucket is the extended learning grant. Um, again, this was board approved back in May. Um, we currently have 3.3 remaining of our um, current allocation. Here are the allowable uses um, as well as the plan. Sorry, and here's the plan, which was previously um, board approved. And I'll pass it back to Mitchell. Yes, and this, these are just, we've listed some of the, uh, the key areas uh, that are in our expenditure plan. Um, so within this, we have, uh, we spent money on our summer programming, project-based learning, SEAL, We've hired additional uh, certificated, classified, and certificated staff for professional learning, uh, project-based learning, mental health supports, and think together as well. So those are some of the, the big topics of what we've already um, budgeted and we've been spending our, um, our funds on for that. And with that, we would like to say thank you and open up for questions. Okay, I guess I'll go first. Um, so I think this is very helpful. Um, and so I really appreciate it. Um, um, I think what would be a good next step is to articulate. Um, I see, and and as you as you pointed out, right, we're we're layering dollars to be able to fully fund some of these pieces, right? So Correct. I think what would be helpful for us to understand is really what are those key 
approaches that we're doubling down on back to um uh, to Sabrina's point about like reimagining or reimagining how we do school, how we do education right mm-hmm. so what are those key strategies that we're focusing on i see them all in here multiple times so let's articulate very clearly what those are and really what the investment in each of those is going to be like the total investment um as well as um one of the things that i get concerned about like so i appreciate that we're spending one time dollars like on our SEL coach what is going to be our plan when those dollars expire in two to three years, right? How are we going to ensure the sustainability, the SEAL coaches, right? How are we going to ensure we're sustainability with the coaches that we're putting in? Um, so I think those are the pieces that I would like to see and understand. So more a more comprehensive view of how the dollars are being spent. Um, that, that's number one for me. Um, I think this is, this is helpful, but really putting dollars next to actual like high doses tutoring, right? Like this is how much we plan to expend. Um, and this is when it's going to start, right? This is how many students we plan to, to be able to reach. Um, um, so I think that that is important to me. Um, just, I, I would like to see that, right? I guess maybe when you bring back the Esther 3 plan, that there, is it the LCAP addendum that you're going to bring back? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a template, right? You're going to fill it, you're going to bring us, right? So um, to understand that. Um, and then for us to have time to have a conversation about what are those areas, right? I, I think I've, I've, I saw on slides, uh, not last time, but the time before, like talking about like bringing IB down to middle school and elementary, right? Like, is that part of it? Is this is that a good use of one-time dollars where we know there's really high startup costs that take three years, right? Maybe we have conversations about what, what are, you know, is that valuable? There are, are there are initial costs around like dual immersion, right? Is it valuable? Project-based learning, right? So so just understanding like how, how important are these each of these pieces and what we're planning to invest in those areas. Um, I was taking a quick look on the website and maybe I'm just not looking in the right area, but it, is our uh, safe, safe to return to school plan um, for the ESSER 3 funds, is that on the website? No, so the ESSER 3, we will actually be bringing it to the board for approval um, at the next board meeting. Was there a, a I think it's called safe to return mm-hmm. plan that had to be posted on an LEA's website. Do yes, we have we, that. And I believe it, that's on our COVID um, tab. But it's a safe school for Where did I find all. the COVID tab? I don't. I don't see a COVID tab. Our reopening. I'm sorry, not COVID. Did you find it, Sabrina? No. If I'm not mistaken, uh, the that plan is a um, it's taking the uh, the appendix protocols with the Cal OSHA prevention plan, and I think those two together is what is referred to as the safety plan. And so there, we don't have them combined here together, but I think those two things make up that plan. And so those are under COVID-19 reopening documents. If I'm on the homepage, where, where, how do I navigate? I apologize for taking up. No worries. I'm looking for Go them. to parents. Parents. Mm-hmm. Reopening schools. Okay, I'll take a look at this page. Thank you. Uh-huh. There's also, uh, there's an icon, a link on the Find It Fast on the homepage that says reopening school. Oh, thank you. Okay, thanks. And I so I just just to add another request. I do want us to think about, and maybe it's not coming with this do- these dollars, but um, we have a significant amount of unspent um, supplemental concentration dollars, right? Over the, right. Okay. So really articulating how we intend to spend those dollars, um, you know, or if there's a plan for it, or if it's something that we're gonna. I, I don't know. I just want to understand. Like, it was how much was it? It was like twenty million. Uh, five million. Oh, sorry. I'm five million. making up numbers. You're like, no, no, no. <laughs> It's five million. So, but that's—I mean—that's a good—that's a good amount of money, right? So, just you know, that that as well. Thinking about how how do we, how is all this going to layer to to build out this this vision that we have? And maybe the vision is the most important piece, right? What is that vision? Right. Yeah, some um, of that has been uh, being spent down also because we had our summer programming um, go into August, and so we still had 
um, invoices coming in from like high tech high from the, you know, PBL professional learning and from think together and all that. So some of those, you know, those things have been spent with that. So. And then my other question for you, speaking about summer learning. Um, yes. So, I mean, the, the state is, is, is investing significantly right in some of these pieces that will come into effect in the next upcoming years. Um, I'm thinking about expanded TK, right. Where now we're not going to be having to fund it out of LCFF. Um, summer expanded learning opportunities because we'll be getting additional dollars for that. Um, the community schools initiative that hopefully we'll apply for and get, right, and be able to layer that onto the work that we do. So I'm just wondering, I don't think that needs to come in like this month, but I do think, I think for us within this year to have a conversation thinking about like, how can those dollars that have been captured that we were using for these pro really, really critical programs, how are we going to think about reallocating those dollars? Yeah, good point. That's all I have, Adrian. Any other questions? Board Member Bo? Not at this time. Thank you. Then we'll move on to 10.0 um, consent calendar and 10.1 approval of consent calendar. So all matters listed under the consent calendar are considered by the Board of Education to be routine and will be enacted in one motion. There will be no discussion of these items unless requested by a board member. If a board member requests discussion, that item will be removed from the consent calendar and considered separately. Is there a motion to? Uh, I make a motion to approve 10.2 through 10.9. I second. I, I think you had made a motion to approve just item 10.1, right? That, that would cover everything. Yeah. And actually, if I could make a substitute motion here. To, pull, to approve all items uh, except for item 10.6. I would just ask Yolanda to amend her motion. It would be the easiest way to do that. Would you? Yeah. So you're, you're going to pull an item? Item 10.6. Oh, okay. So um, I retract my motion. Uh, make a motion to approve 10.1, the consent calendar with the exception of 10.6. I second that motion. Any? Discussion? Now let's vote. And the motion passes four to four yes to one absent. So now moving on to item 11.1, uh, which is the approval of the contract between Azusa Unified School District and Nancy Akavian Consulting, Inc. Uh, is there a motion to approve? I make a motion to approve 11.1. Moved by board member Rodriguez Pena. I'll second. Seconded by board member uh, Cruz Gonzalez. And discussion, let, let, me, let me start. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. As, as I'm looking at the document that's that's attached, this is a um, this is a contract document from from the consultant, correct? Or is this so th this is not our? Correct. That's correct. Okay. I so I, I know we we've had some conversation about this in, in the past, and I and I'm and I'm com I'm I'm comfortable with this this document as as is, but I want to I want to remind us and 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 kind of. Um, Look at which what the, the types of documents that we are we are creating, and when we are entering into these agreements, how, how might we shape and craft um, how, when we're entering into agreements? Most importantly, what I what I'm looking for that I don't exactly see. I, I do see that well, it it talks about um, the contractor services and so professional development on small group literacy, but still, what, what's missing is what, what are what are our, our hope for outcomes when when we're when we're doing this? What are we what are we hoping that through this what happens and and what are those success indicators just as we are evaluating these these dollars that are spent year to year that we just have an opportunity to say this was worth that investment and here's how we here's how we know that. I'm ask a clarifying question sure. uh, because we definitely heard that um, and I think uh, to the board's point last time I think that some of the uh, consultants um, we're not doing that. And so with our last uh, board meeting, actually with this board meeting, coming up here on 12.1, um, 
we trying to ensure that those things are there. This is this is a contract, and so I just want to make sure that I, I understand fully. Um, are we talking about all contracts? Are we talking about instructional contract? Um, um, so that again, so that we know, you know, moving forward, because I mean, contracts come. I mean, there's lots of them, and some are, you know, uh, for repairs, and some are for um, like this one for instruction. Uh, so just want to make sure that as 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 we're moving forward to make sure that we're doing the, what's being asked. Yeah, I would say that in in the recent past, I have heard a lot of uh, conversation and question around how our district utilized the ways that we utilize consultants and and the differences between choosing to utilize consultants for things versus building capacity within our own district to, to be able to do things and not needing consultants. Um, and it's also my my understanding that even prior to me being part of part of this board, that there was uh, a, a tremendous reduction in number of consultants that, that we use. And so therefore, those that we do use, we're, we're bringing forward because we, we've already kind of filtered through and decided now that the ones that we have, they are they are worth that the, the, the while and an investment of, of the dollars that we're spending and what an ROI that we get from that. So knowing all of that and and being being mindful of, of that, I guess I guess my request is when when we are so I don't know how maybe maybe consultant is broad uh, is, is a broad term. Um, but but yeah, my request, I guess, broad, broadly is as we are entering into those and we're spending dollars, maybe if we have a threshold, maybe, maybe if there's a threshold of dollars or or uh, that, that we are saying that beyond this threshold, then we are, this is the accountability that we put in place to say that we're spending these dollars. And this is the, this is the ROI, ROI we are expecting. Um, and also benchmarks to be able to say that we still, we still think it's worthwhile to invest these dollars in, in a consultant or, or to, because we don't have the capacity within our, our district, but we're not getting that from this particular um, consultant or this particular agency. And so that, that moves us to look, to look elsewhere. Uh, it would just be helpful for me. It would be informative for me as a board member as I'm making some of those decisions to, to have a better sense of, um, of, of, of those performance indicators. So to add on to what board member Greer is saying, I, I think what I would like to see, and this is a discussion item, is for, you know, I, I'd like to see a standardized contract template for management consulting. So I think many of the things that fall under um, curriculum instruction, like Ms. Akavan's contract, and she's a, a continuing person. We've heard her name come up over again. Um, maybe we saw Ms. Amos's contract, right? So having the district finalize its contract and say that, you know, we're comfortable with all the terms, we're protected, and building in the requirement to have the detailed scope of work that describes dates, timelines, deliverables, quantities, so that the questions that we have brought up in recent meetings, we can feel more comfortable with that. Any contract, any consultant that's engaging with us, we're going to have to put in that work to fill it all out before it comes to board so that maybe we won't have questions or that all the information that's presented is comprehensive. Is that a possibility? So just a couple of things just for, so, and I know it's broad, but so there are people like Nancy, this is a business. Right, so she has a contract. There are people like Chrissy Jones, uh, who is a consultant, right? And they might not have a business, and so we're just going to hire the consultant to do X, Y, Z. Uh, so those are two different processes, if you will, right? Um, but just like we strike a contract with um, Nick Parton, right, to come and help us with the network or whatever. Um, so those are two kind of different ways that consultants might come come to us. Uh, but I think it's still, I think there's some, there, there's some doable. I, I know that some, some companies, this is our contract and this is, you know, what we do. Um, I'm sure that there's going to be lag time there uh, because, you know, they're going to say this is our contract. I'm going to say, okay, well, we're, we're, we're sending it back because we have, we want these things uh, there. Then they're going to say, okay, well, hold on. Let's, we have to check with legal. And so there, there'll, there'll be a disruption there in terms of uh, timeliness. Um, but 
I mean, again, can it be done? I'm sure it can be done. Mr. Higg, I'm looking at these. I mean, Nancy, Ms. Jones, Ms. Amos, they're all independent contractors, whether or not they're incorporated as an LLC or, 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 or working as a sole proprietor. So I think the umbrella of independent contractor versus a firm like Nick Partners, I think that's a, a line of demarcation. And I think, you know, for example, if we were contracting with Pepsi, we're going to use Pepsi's contract, right? They were the bigger fish. Um, but if we're working with independent contractors or smaller, smaller consulting firms or that, that we're engaging as an independent contractor, I think at district, we can have our own standardized and vetted form that we can use. And then if the contractor, if the consultant wants to negotiate on that, then you can entertain that on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on what, they, what flexibility they're asking for. So I, I just want to add to that um, because I think, to, I mean, I know you said that some of them have their own contracts, but we know that there's some entities like, I will say, LACO, who insist you use their contract or go away, right? I don't, I'm not saying that we need to be that inflexible, but I think that it makes sense for us to have our own contract. The second piece around like some of the content pieces that, that Sabrina talked about in terms of like what are deliverables, what are expected outcomes. I would expect that would be coming from our staff, right? Because you are bringing the consultant in and in your mind, you're bringing them in for a specific purpose. And so maybe that doesn't belong in the contract. I know before Adrian, there was this form developed that, that, that you were supposed to fill out or for any contract. Um, I think that I felt a little onerous to me and maybe a, a misfit, right? But I think maybe more deliberate about what those expected outcomes are and maybe end some of the, end the benchmark. I think that's what I hear my colleagues saying. Those are our responsibilities. Right. And those are the things I think that we as a board are asking that we expect to see when contracts come. To I think that's fair, yeah. I'm going to keep pushing. I just want to make sure I, because I, I, I heard something different here. So, so maybe on the LACO, like, well, this is the contract or the Pepsi or whatever. Um, but that doesn't preclude us or stop us from saying, in the rationale or in, in a subsequent, like, hey, this is what we're expecting out of this contract or this consultant. These are the deliverables. These are the benchmarks. So, yeah, I, 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 I would say that that sounds, it sounds like you're capturing the, the, the spirit behind the, the, some of the conversation and the request here. Is it, would it be more helpful or, or not? If, if you and or your team were to look at what, what some of those guidelines would be, because, because you are there and you're hearing what, what some of the requests that we're making, does it make more sense for you to put some of those guidelines or thresholds or, 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 or how we go about that? Because there are probably exceptions that we don't know or don't realize. And so as we're, if we're making a request and you walk away from this as a, as a, a board directive and then find yourself in a, in, in a, that we that we didn't anticipate that maybe you all could have anticipated is 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 that a would that be a more appropriate way um, to communicate the, the guidelines through which we approach that and then even if that was thrown into a I I would be comfortable with I, I don't know if it was is it something that needs to be approved or is in a is in a packet I, I, it would be helpful if, if it somehow came back to a board meeting for info even if it was in consent I don't know that we need to talk a whole lot more about it unless someone wants to but it might be helpful just to communicate. Uh, publicly, this is an approach that we're going to take. <clears throat> and maybe let me ask more specifically: Would that be more? Is is what is that? Is that feasible? And is and is, does does that have the potential to make uh, the work that you all have to do easier um, by 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 doing this and and still get us to where we're where we're asking, or would it be better for the the uh, previous request? I think the latter request. If you allow us the opportunity to wrap our heads around this and then bring it forward, I think that 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 would be the best. Perfect. Okay. Then any other any additional discussion? Then let's go ahead and vote. And the item passes four yes to, excuse me, to one absent.
Moving on to 12.0 curriculum and instruction. Uh, item 12.1, approval of the, con of the consultant agreement between Azusa Unified School District, AUSD, and Christy Jones Holistic Health and Mindfulness Coach. Is there a motion to approve? I make a motion to approve 12.1. Moved by board member Rodriguez Pena. I second the motion. And seconded by board member Bo. Any discussion? Then let's go ahead and vote. And I would just say this is a good example of how it's really clear what it's going to be, what this is for, it's clear when it's going to happen. I think, you know. And the item passes for yes, the one absent. Moving to item 12.2, approval of the contract between Azusa Unified School District and the Tides Center. Is there a motion to approve? Make a motion on 12.2. Moved by board member Rodriguez Pena. I'll second. Seconded by board member Rodriguez, uh, excuse me, Cruz Gonzalez. Uh, any discussion? Let's go and vote. And the motion passes for yes to one absent. Moving to item 12.3, public hearing for sufficiency of instructional materials. Is there a motion to open this public hearing? I make a motion on 12.3 to open the public hearing. Moved by board member Rodriguez Pena. Do we have a second? I second the motion. Seconded by board member Bo. Um, and so this, the public hearing then is um, opened at 8.33 p.m. Uh, Lika, do we have anyone online who wishes to speak at this time? We do not have any hands raised at this time. Any comments from the board? So <clears throat> this um, attestation that we have sufficiency of instruction materials, does this include any materials that are on back order that we have not yet received? Or how, how do we count what is sufficient? Does that mean it's physically in hand and distributed to students? What, what is our threshold? It's both in hand and it's also online. Um, it can be either one. Uh, the Los Angeles County Office of Education, um, uh, we do a survey for them of all the, um, the instructional materials that we have. And so um, we have certifications from all of our principals um, that we have sufficiency of all of our materials. And does that sufficiency mean that there is one license or one textbook per student? Or does that mean, could it also, could it instead mean that there is a class set for students to use when they're on campus? No, it's not a class set. It's one, it would be one per student that they would be able to use in class and take home as well. Is this the same or different from Williams Act requirement? Uh, it's the same. Thank you. Those are my questions. You're welcome. Any other questions? Then I will go ahead and close this public hearing at 8.35 p.m. And we will move to item 12.4. Approval of resolution 21-2205, sufficiency of instructional materials. Is there a motion to approve? I make a motion to approve 12.4. Moved by Board Member Rodriguez-Pena. Do we have a second? I second the motion. Seconded by board member Bo. Any discussion? Then let's go ahead and vote. And the motion passes for yes to one absent. Moving on to item 13.0, uh, and actually, 13.1 through 13.6, which are curriculum and uh, uh, policies, policies and bylaws. Are there any items between 13.1 to 13.6 that any board member has any questions or comments in regards to? Hearing, hearing none, we will move to item 14.0, uh, adjournment. 
Uh, do we have a motion to approve our adjournment? I make a motion on 14.1 meeting adjournment. I second the motion. Moved by Board Member Rodriguez Pena, seconded by Board Member Bo. Any discussion? Bye. <laughs> hearing, <laughs> hearing none. Uh, let's go ahead and vote. And the motion passes four yes to one absent, and our meeting is adjourned at 8.37 p.m. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Have a good night.